Hello, um, welcome to uh, this live uh, online meeting of the Antiquarian Booksellers Association Education Trust Institute of English Studies uh, Book Collecting Seminars. And I am delighted to welcome Jasper Jennings. Uh, Jasper uh, graduated in history from Manchester in 1999 and pretty soon after that joined Grosvenor Prince in Covent Garden where he stayed for some time. Uh, he had a stint in a New York gallery working with American imprints um, and then in November 2008 he started dealing independently and offering freelance broking, valuation and cataloguing services. He joined the ABA as an associate member in 2013 and exhibited under his own banner at the Olympia Book Fair in 2014 and at Chelsea the following year. He has worked as a book valuer for tenants auctioneers in North Yorkshire and recently in the rare book department at Hayward Hill. Uh, he has written on all aspects of the, um, of the uh, printed market of the market in printed collectibles for various trade and heritage publications. And he is currently in the process of winding up his trading activities, although he will continue to provide consultancy services. As he's doing this at the present time, he felt that this was a good chance to uh, reflect on the material that has passed through his hands. Uh, without further ado, over to you, Jasper. Thank you very much, Leo. Um, I'll now share my presentation with you all. Hopefully uh, you can all see that and um, perhaps see me in the corner of your screens as well. Um, and um, my thanks again to Leo and to the uh, ABA Educational Committee Education Committee for allowing me this chance to give um, this groundbreaking webinar uh, in the book collecting series. Uh, and um, please do bear with me if uh, it's not the smoothest ride technically, um, as I haven't actually presented before um, virtually over the internet. But um, anyway, I will uh, be delighted to share with you some uh, of the printed imagery which have passed through my hands um, over my time as a dealer, as Leo said. Um, my, my presentation will not be chronological. Um, I'm primarily interested in why these images was, were printed and how they were consumed by their primary market. Um, so the, the presentation will be loosely arranged by intention of the publisher and function of the print, I suppose. Um, and uh, I will demonstrate that of course, most of these images are commercial propositions, essentially intended for utilitarian purposes. Um, a tiny proportion of these images had any to art, although some did and do have a, have a relationship with to fine art, have some, sometimes an indirect one and sometimes a complex one. Um, we will see that uh, even supposedly impartial, simple visual reports uh, are more likely to reflect how the image maker wanted the first viewers to think things were, are, or once were, or could be, rather than how things were. Um, we must always bear in mind that before the use of photography became widespread in, I guess, the sort of 1860s, generally in general use, uh, the printed image was the only medium of mass visual communication. Um, these prints shaped how people saw their world, and I do find it fascinating to examine the impact printed imagery had on those first viewers. Some of you may even recognise some of these prints. Uh, perhaps I uh, bought or even sold them from you. We can start with uh, a bit of nudity. Um, very tasteful, of course. I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about book illustration. Um, with which many of you I know are well versed. Uh, of course, we, the first prints made in England were woodcuts, which Caxton used to illustrate his books in about 1481, I believe. Um, this is a rather more sophisticated example uh, from 1795. 
um, it's sort of classic example of the sort of romantic sensibility in some ways. Um, after Frances Francesco Bartolozzi after Thomas Stothard, who were both very respected artists and, in, um, and draftsmen in their own right. They're both RAs. Um, and it's just, it's just an image I happen to like from Milton's Paradise Lost. Um, it's also a chance to say that biblical imagery um, in terms of, and Christian imagery in terms of images of saints, the Virgin, the crucifixion um, for straight devotional purposes is not a very English phenomenon. And obviously going back to the Reformation, um, or even though some of the earliest prints, in particular in Europe, well, and indeed in, in England, were woodcut images of saints and sold at shrines or indulgences. Um, so Christian iconography, of course, remains a recurring and important theme throughout the history of image making in Britain, but um, it's usually filtered through a lens of literature, perhaps, like the as in this example, or uh, perhaps through sort of morality, discussion of morality. Um, and certainly, uh, I think most uh, print dealers will tell you that religious subject matter is a tough sell, certainly um, Christian religious subject matter. So most, I mean, before the mid to end of the 19th century, the way most people came across the printed image was, um, well, simultaneous with their contact with the printed word, which is through the um, cheaply printed broadsides. So, um, so that's mostly text and some imagery printed on cheaply on one side of a sheet of paper, um, ballads as well, bought from pellet, uh, sorry, peddlers, street hawkers, even bellmen, i.e. town criers, would sell them. These were news and entertainment, um, sometimes, of course, simultaneously. Sensational tales of murder, crime, doomed lovers, freaks, wonders. Patriotism, morality, again, was a theme. Famous military victories. Uh, here is um, William Marshall Craig's depiction of uh, a playbill seller outside the Theatre Royal Drury Lane. Um, and this uh, on the left is a cheap anonymous etching, uh, probably very late 18th century, um, which I just have in a scrapbook I bought some years ago, uh, that would have been printed on a large sheet alongside other cries, and has just been cut up and put in this scrapbook. But it's a ballad seller, or ballad monger. Often they were women. Um, she's probably singing out some verses from Willie of the Dale, a new song. They often sung as part of their advertising pitch, and uh, you can see she's got quite a long strip of um, verses in her hand. I think these these were pup, these were printed in strips, uh, cut up, and um, quite long strips, apparently. Often these ballads, and these are just I think fascinating sort of uh, depictions of a lot of a lost street culture, really. Now, a one broadside I've got or had was uh, a cricket subject matter. A lot of these, this material was sold at the event. This was certainly advertising event. It may have been sold out during the match as well. Um, so often executions, theatre performances, as we've seen, fairs, festivals, but sporting events too. And uh, this, I suppose, is more properly an item of ephemera for the ephemerist. Who, um, and I'm primary print seller. I mean, I don't, I don't, I didn't, don't deal in much ephemera, but uh, I found this fascinating. I, I picked it up quite cheaply at auction, I felt. So I was very pleased to get this apparently unrecorded broadside. And you can see it features a woodcut vignette at the top of a game in progress, presumably from the stock block of the printer in Newcastle. Um, that's advertised the opening day of the, the opening match for the Gateshead Borough Cricket Club, as you can see. And I think this is really to demonstrate that um, most image making throughout this period was intended to evoke stock responses and not impart new information or uh, broaden viewers' visual experience or visual appreciation of the world. And presumably, if you couldn't read, you could pretty quickly tell that this was a poster about cricket and you could ask your mate who could read what's going on and he could tell you the details. And you could turn up at the Gateshead Borough Cricket Club which is just really to emphasize the point that um, image, the image can penetrate deeper than society than the printed word, because obviously a lot of people can't read. 
Uh, he is a, a sort of, I suppose, a straightforward pictorial news report in some ways. This was another event which which broadsides would also have been sold. The Namakia in Hyde Park, uh, part of a big jubilee, as it was called, as it was called, jubilee celebration of the peace with Napoleon, which of course didn't turn out to be a long-lasting peace because he came back in 1814. And it's a, a re naval reenactment of, of uh, some of the great, probably the Battle of the Nile foremost, but some of the great British naval victories. We've got kids playing, we've got uh, families enjoying the enactment on the Serpentine, which probably more rural then, because they've got some deer in the park, which look like llamas, but I suspect they're supposed to be deer. And, um, We've got uh, here also, I've got a detail from another print I owned, which shows celebrations outside the Covent Garden Opera, well, it's now the Royal Opera House, uh, in Bow Street. We've got a special performance. Nelson Forever is illuminated above the back entrance there. You can see people spilling into Bow Street, uh, including some actors probably dressed in Oriental costume. Uh, and um, there, you can see that some of the celebrants, one of them is reading, well, two of them are reading broadside news sheets. And one of them seems to be reading, if I can highlight that, uh, news of the destruction of Lorient, which was the French flagship at the Battle of the Nile. It blew up, its magazine, its powder magazine ignited during the battle and it blew up spectacularly. And uh, as we'll see in the next slide, Enterprising theatre managers and uh, showmen took advantage of this event and very quickly um, produced uh, performances, not just at Covent Garden, at Sadler's Wells Theatre, where apparently the stage was flooded with real water, as it says. This is an image from the British Museum. I'd love to have owned this myself, but I, did, I didn't. Um, and you could see Lorient blowing up spectacularly there. And this went on for night after night. Um, I think in March 1815, when after Napoleon had returned and then been defeated. No, he hadn't been defeated yet, but he'd come back. So he was back in the news. So that shows more broadsides. And the fame of the Battle of the Nile continued into the Victorian period. Here we can see what's who's probably a, well, it's a British, Greenwich pensioner built beside the base of the statue of George II outside the Greenwich. Royal Hospital. Uh, he's a veteran of that battle, we assume. I mean, being Victorian, this is there's a whole backstory behind this print. Um, and he's showing his young grandson an image of uh, that very same event, the blowing up of Lorient. And um, you can see that um, a street peddler is hoping to sell um, to sell him that framed print. He's hovering over the shoulder of the pensioner. Um, he seems to be a rather more upmarket peddler than some we've already seen. The prints are framed quite nicely by the looks of it, whether that's uh, slightly glamorized by the um, print, well, by Hollis, I'm not sure. Um, so that's yet more evidence of uh, street vendors going about their business. Now, this is um, interesting to pertinent to this discussion on a number of levels. To gin drinkers, it is, uh, this started life as a wood engraved copy of William Hogarth's famous Gin Lay, by, printed by J.L. Marx, who was a well-known sort of popular and toy theater printer in the 1830s and 1840s. Um, now, what's interesting, particularly in this example, and he, it was probably originally probably originally published with the with its paired Beer Street, um, which of course both of which were published by Hogarth at least hundred years before, in the mid eighteenth century. Um, but it's been overprinted by uh, separately, could have been some years later, uh, and has now become a temperance broadside. It's um, there's seven lines of verse warning against the perils of the demon drink beneath the image there. And you can see a price has been printed. It's not aligned, so it's just been very quickly printed separately by a letterpress printer over the image uh, on cheap wood pulp paper. So this is a sort of interesting example of, I suppose, 
portrayed in Im recycled imagery. Um, I suspect that that image, of course, would have already been familiar to a lot of people who bought it on the street because they'd seen, if not, a, well, they wouldn't have seen the paintings by Hogarth. They might have seen early impressions of the paintings issued by Hogarth. They might have seen the countless variants and reprints over the years, in, in intervening years. They're familiar with the image, so they can relate to it. And even if they're not familiar with the image, it's a pretty shocking image. But it's simplified. You've got the um, the mother neglecting her baby who's tumbling down the steps. Uh, you've got you've got some of the emblematic symbolism of Hogarth, which was quite complex, has been simplified, but it's, uh, the message is pretty clear, even if you can't read. Again, um, so this is an example of a sort of repurposed print, a print that has become a, an item of ephemeron. Uh, I bought that, uh, found it in the stock of an ABA member. And I believe, I think I sold it to a, someone who was interested in the history of temperance. So um, that was, I was pleased to have that. Now, persuasion, on the theme of persuasion and propaganda, well, I had to get this one in. This is a depiction of the famous Peterloo massacre. On St. Peter's Fields, Manchester, 18, 1819, beg your pardon. Um, it is an etching by a Manchester-based engraver and printer, John Slack. Now, um, it's not much text in here. It's all pretty much all image, as you can see. Uh, and I actually picked this up at ABA Chelsea a few years back. Um, but again, the power you'll see from the power of the image um, that very little text is really needed. Uh, and it's interestingly, it's lettered a cabinet picture drawn and etched by J. Slack Manchester for, for private use only. It's quite a small thing. It's only sort of, um, it's a bit bigger than A4, but not much bigger. Uh, so these are small images for private use, uh, you know, not for display, they're for sympathizers. Slack is clearly in sympathy with the crowd on that day. Here's a, we'll zoom in a bit on the image. I mean, look at that. There's the mounted yeomanry going in. He's emphasized the respectability of the crowd. He's shown a lot of women in the crowd fleeing from the sabers. Um, so this is clearly distributed, printed soon after the event for sympathizers to, to keep in their own homes, keep in their portfolios, keep in their cabinets, and um, that was a great, I was very pleased to have it, um, especially as printed in Manchester. So you didn't have to buy from a street peddler. Of course, there were shops, retail premises for prints throughout this period. Um, in the 17th century, they tended to be more humble. Well, most shops were fairly humble retail premises, either below or in front of the printer's workshop and sold by the printer themselves. themselves. Of course, it became more sophisticated as the 18th century went on and turned into the 19th century. You had Ackerman's Repository of Arts in the Strand, which was quite a grand premises. And you had S.J. Fuller & Co. in Rathbone Place, in the West End. Uh, and this, this image of the shop would have been inserted into um, probably a smart periodical publication, uh, the Gentleman's Magazine, perhaps, something like that, or a, a trade directory. And we can see um, a gentleman appears to be perusing some printed imagery on the right there. So um, it's quite, it's, it's equivalent to a very glossy um, advertising because it uses some aquatint, I should say, in there. That's important. There's sort of that tonality. So there's some aquatint in there. And of course, you could pull it out of your the bound volume and distribute it to pass it on to friends and as if it was a flyer. So um, that's sort of the top end of the trade. There were print auctions, of course, I mean, as well. Peeps, Peeps writes to Evelyn about going to an auction, but we won't be talking about auctions today. Now, this is included primarily as evidence of the consumption of uh, these prints. And if you can, you can see behind uh, the woman at the table, who's been interrupted by a smuggling party. She's got a sort of broadside on the wall there, uh, which may well be a wanted poster for perhaps some of these very, the very men intruders who've just burst into the room. It's after David Wilkie, very good Scottish artist and RA. Um, and it's um, also 
It's a sort of large quarto size steel engraving, fairly typical of the early Victorian period. And it's also an exemplar of a phenomenon of that time. It was part of, it was issued as part of a series after contemporary artists issued in parts to subscribers to a sort of print collector's club, which became quite common as the Victorian period progressed. Um, they were called the Art Union and things like that. They would meet, have lectures, discuss the latest art with reference to these engravings. So, um, you know, they, they could all put together, peruse a portfolio of these engravings. Obviously, they didn't have access to high quality digital imagery or the painting itself, like we do today. And um, these sort of initiatives fostered the sort of print collector phenomenon, which is a very English phenomenon, I think, which I'm not sure. Sadly, I don't think there are dedicated print collectors today, actually. It's, an, it's another discussion point. Well, I mean, there are, I'm sure there are some, but not in the numbers there used to be, because print buyers, I, f I find now, also tend to be buyers of painting, sculpture, uh, and a lot of them, just, I think, see these kind of these prints now as a sort of curiosity. Now, this is, uh, this is an interesting print, which I have had a copy, an impression of this print. This is a copy in the British Museum because sadly I did not take a good image of, of it when I had it. It sold very quickly, as you can imagine when I had it. Um, Westminster Hall. This is a, a venue that um, I'm no doubt the ABA would love to hold a print fair in. Um, that famous hammer beam, hammer beam roof. It's a fascinating composition. Um, there's lots going on there, but apparently while Westminster Hall held the Lord, housed the law courts until 1882, which were just sort of small, so, you know, 20 foot by 20 foot wooden partitions, actually, with a few benches in them. Uh, there was also stationary prints, trinkets, the wares of seamstresses, etc., were sold from stalls uh, also in the hall at the same time as cases were being heard. Um, I, found, I found my example at uh, General Antiques Fair, um, just in a, in a corner of in a, in a sort of neglected corner in a gymnasium, I seem to remember. I was very pleased to have that. Um, this is, and it was indeed the Laurie and Whittle version I found, which is a 1797 reprint of a plate first published in the mid 18th century. Um, and again, there seemed to be some prints being sold there in the image. You've got some various sort of pompous looking legal types. It is a satire. I should add, because it's mainly the satirical, it's sort of illustrating the satirical verses in four columns below. Um, and I'm going to talk a bit more about the, the, the very English phenomenon of satire. Um, this is Padre at a time when the text was sort of becoming less, was taking up less space and the image was taking up more space in the mid 18th century. Um, in, as the satirical broadside developed and became um, much more about the graphic imagery rather than, the or at least as much about the graphic imagery than the as the text. Um, and it's after uh, Gravelot, who was a Frenchman actually called Hubert Francois Bourguignon, who was very influential with Hogarth. They helped, he helped set up the St. Martin's Lane Academy. So he's a proper draftsman and graver in, himself, in his own right. And you can see this is a fairly sophisticated image. There's lots going on. And it just demonstrates how important foreign uh, engravers were to the whole print trade in Britain, particularly the Dutch in the 17th century, the French more increasingly in the 18th century. Gravelot was a Frenchman from, from Paris, as you might have guessed. So London was this time was becoming the centre of an international trade network. Now these are also satirical prints, but they also illustrate the consumption of prints at home. You've got the tax receiver on the left, um, plump, well fed, with all the accoutrements of a gentleman, a nice fob watch, waistcoat, fine shining shoes. Behind him, in his well furnished interior, you can see, looks like a fairly classical nude oil perhaps, in a quite elaborate frame. It's quite faint, there's just a suggestion of it. Uh, the taxpayer on the right, as you can see, he's in his cottage, he's um, in ragged clothes. He's got a humble hearth above which is uh, pinned, looks like a picture of a prize ox to me, or perhaps a pig, I don't know, but it's um, some, some livestock print, which will 
actually just come on to, I've got examples of that myself, but um, which again is quite a British phenomenon of the animal portrait. But um, so that's, so they're sort of emphasizing the contrast in wealth there. And this was published actually in the run up to the um, Great Reform Act of 1832. So it's, so here, Henry Alkin, who was of course, primarily known as a sporting artist, an animal artist here, he's sort of drawing the explicit connection here between political status and so what you might be now what might now be called socioeconomic status. I think he's sort of strongly implying that ex that uh, the exclusion of certain men uh, to of the to the franchise uh, was meant that they were unfairly unfairly impacted uh, and financially and were obliged to pay most of what they earned up to the people who did have the property and had the vote. Now, satire in this period was one of the great British exports, actually, when it comes to uh, products of the printing press. This cartoon was first published as a single sheet caricature by Fours in London in February 1799. Um, which was really the height of what you might call the golden age of the single sheet satire production in Britain. Uh, Britain, Britain, we had freedom, relative freedom, well, freedom of expression compared to most of our continental regimes at the time. We had factionalism in party po and party politics, the Whigs and the Tories, and we had a receptive, com commercially receptive market for these prints. Those are the three conditions that no one else in Europe quite had. Uh, so, um, but this example impression here was published, as you can see, in Germany for the London and Paris und Paris magazine in 1799, um, the same year, a few months later. And it's an exact, very faithful, but slightly reduced copy of Fawes's cartoon. You can see it's got, you can see a fold because uh, it was folded into the periodical, of course. So that just shows um, how popular British prints were becoming abroad to, um, at this time. It's actually about the, uh, the you, as you probably, some of you would have guessed, the, pr the print is, by the way, about um, agitation to build up towards the act of union between Britain and Ireland, and, uh, which eventually happened with the union of the parliament in 1800. So, um, yeah, satire is, is still one of the most buoyant areas of collecting to this day. And um, that's where you can find some of the strongest prices for traditional prints. And a big debt is owed to the aforementioned Hogarth and his moral, modern moral subject. And he really kick-started the, the whole boom, really, uh, in, in political and social satire in Britain. Here's a satirical portrait uh, from 1809 by Charles Williams. Um, this was the, Mrs. Clark was the mistress at the time of Frederick Duke of York and she was embroiled in a cash for commission scandal because he was commander in chief of the army. And this shows her about to enter the chamber of the House of Commons to give evidence implicating the Duke. Um, so probably made a few at the palace wince. And on that subject, um, it's actually interesting to speculate that some famous satirical prints are very rare and only known in a handful or one or two impressions, partly because actually the, I mean, the palace could not suppress print production like perhaps its French equivalents could, but it could buy up. It used to hastily run out and buy up a lot of, um, buy an entire print run of certain prints it didn't like and probably dispose of them. Um, because Hannah Humphrey's shop, for example, she was the publisher of Gilray, was on St. James's street just up the road from St. James's Palace, so they, it wasn't far to go in some cases to send a servant to do that. Um, and it's just a fascinating phenomenon, yeah. The graphic satire is a sort of hybrid medium, it inhabits, sort of, it some way operates within the spheres of art, part journalism, part politics. There's a lot of references, lit literary, ref literary references. Not in this example so much, but um, very popular with institutional custom clients and with private alike. Now we've got a very respectable portrait here of an elderly Duke of Wellington. Um, and just while we're on the satire, I've, oh, I often 
slightly lament the fact that there was no, we don't have surviving, no surviving British imagery of pictorial political satire until the 1680s in this country. So we have, or indeed, scarcely any visual record of topical, re topical record of those tumultuous public events, the gunpowder plot, the civil war, King Charles's execution. All our imagery, contemporary imagery, comes from prints published abroad. Uh, and I find that uh, fascinating because, I mean, imagine, you know, if we'd had, we'd had a Jacques Callot working in Britain who, who depicted uh, France's 30s war in the 1630s graphically, if you know, our whole view of that century might be different. But back to this slide, um, it's in Metzitint, which the French called La Manière Anglaise because uh, its tonality was designed to reproduce sort of formal, the oil painting and the formal style of portraiture. And this is definitely a print you bought in a shop rather than, by the way. Uh, here's another image of Wellington. And uh, this is a very, a silhouette print, as you can see, which is very popular at the time. Um, silhouette portraits were often a very cheap and uh, accessible way for the poor to have their portraits done. It was sort of a function, I suppose, taken over by the studio photographer in the later Victorian period. So and you could go to places like Brighton Pier and have your silhouette done. Um, it was often done in the home as a sort of entertainment. You just needed a candle, a source of light to project someone's profile onto a screen, which you could then trace. But this, uh, a, a, a publisher called Bruce, a printer called Bruce, I think he operated in Smithfield, London. Um, he specialised in sort of profile silhouettes like this one. So it's sort of playing on the fact that it's a popular medium, but it's the grand old Duke of Wellington who, in November 1830, when this was printed, had just lost a vote of no confidence in his ministry, and his ministry fell, hence the title, a celebrated commander on the retired list. I rather like the chairs, by the way. Here's a big set piece group portrait, 1849, similar period. Um, I guess, well, photography at this point, there were photographs around, but they couldn't take, certainly couldn't take large group photographs like this outdoors. I mean, this is an imaginary composition entirely. Well, it's a real location, Brighton. It's an imaginary event. It's an imaginary cricket match, never happened, featuring the patrons of, of the game, several Victorian aristocrats and gentlemen. And it's definitely a shop print. Um, it, it was uh, a separate key plate was printed, which I also owned alongside. And you can see the names of 48 men who appear in the composition. Um, and it is all men in the entire composition, I think. Uh, so these men had all subscribed to proof and early impressions of the print. So in a sense, this is the print trade driving the painting. I mean, there was a painting that was exhibited in Brighton the publisher's gallery, Mason, um, and that would have been for sale as well, but eventually, after the after first few copies were sold. Uh, so, yeah, subscription was a good popular way of defraying your costs and making sure you had a market established before you went to the business of printing a big, expensive uh, print like this. It was well, a very big print, by the way, I should say. Um, so, um, yeah, you could certainly, these, these men would all bought a copy and then later copies their friends would have bought, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, um, the painting is helping to publicize the print and vice versa. And uh, in fact, I sold this impression to a descendant of one of those men depicted. So it shows the power, power of connections and family, uh, the family association to this day. Now, I mentioned the British animal portrait. Uh, we, we get lots of uh, farm animals from the period, emphasising the fertility and productivity of gentlemen farmers and their land. Here we've got a racehorse, of course, by the, after the great master George Stubbs. He was a very good animal uh, painter. And again, he was worked with in demand all in the continent of Europe and all over Britain. Uh, this is Pumpkin at Newmarket, where he won lots of races. And in fact, it was a double portrait because the jockey old South is up. Um, it's a very sophisticated production. Uh, it's engraved by G. George Townley Stubbs, the son of George Stubbs. You have used the roulette wheel, uh, a bit of stipple, a bit of etching. Um, 
And um, yeah, I mean, when I started in this business, there were lots of dedicated collectors for Stubbs' work, and they particularly liked, a lot of them were racing fans, hunters, and liked his uh, racehorse portraits, but uh, that's, that sort of side of collecting seems to have dried up a bit, or be on the wane at the moment, uh, for reasons I'm not entirely clear about, but um, those sort of loyal followers of particular artists or schools of engra or engravers, indeed, doesn't seem to exist as a phenomenon. Well, that's a lovely print. That was, again, that was sold at the Turf Gallery, which was called, well, Stubbs's Turf Gallery, where you could actually go and view the painting, of course. So that's another sort of commercial package, really. And the relationship between print and painting is a dog um, with the collar. His collar is lettered with his, uh, the eccentric Yorkshire sportsman Colonel Thornton's name. And what I particularly want to draw your attention to here is the sort of dramatic, almost sublime landscape actually around the dog. Um, because it's an example of how successfully the two printmakers, Robert Pollard, who was a very great um, etcher and engraver of uh, sporting animal subjects, and Francis Jukes, who was a great aquatinter, he was a specialist aquatinter, they have powers of combined here to create that depth, that tonality. That's romantic sensibility that, and, uh, which Sori Gilpin, the artist, wanted, was, was, was very well, much schooled in. And so it's a very successful translation, if you like, of an artist's vision into print. And, and by the way, notice that the um, artist and engraver have jointly published this. So they've effectively taken a joint share in copyright, a joint share in costs, and a joint share in proceeds as well, of course. So the evidence of another great primary source of the marketing prints, of course, is the trade catalogues themselves. I've got this copy of Sam Bennett's catalogue for 1775, which was uh, printed in facsimile by the Holland Press in 1970. And you will see that page 58 here, the first talks about perspective views and says they are admirably adapted for the diagonal mirror or optical pillar machine, which must be in the zograscope, which was a um, sort of convex uh, lens for viewing prints, magnifying prints through an angled mirror. That was a very popular sort of parlor, parlor pastime of the, of the day. Here's one of those perspective views of Udoptique, as the French called it. Uh, supposedly a depiction of royal troops entering New York in September 1776 during the American War of Independence, published in, the, in Augsburg, Bavaria, which was a big center for prints, particularly these kind of prints production at the time, it was published in a booklet, and that again would have been put on a, on a surface and viewed through the zograscope. Um, and it's just um, sort of emphasizing the fact that uh, there's no faith, no real attempt to recreate what New York looked like no one had very few people had been there very few of the viewers were going to go there certainly the artist hadn't been there it's the baroque southern german sort of baroque architecture um, so we know there was fun prints for the education of children and adults here's a puzzle print where the outline profiles of various statesmen and include and royals including queen victoria the bottom right their uh, outline profiles are visible in the branches of this fairy oak. Um, I suppose these statesmen and royals were kind of celebrities of their age. I mean, they were the only other big celebrities were actors, but very few people knew what they looked like because they were very usually in costume, makeup, I suppose, except for people like Garrick and the really top ones. But um, so that's a bit of fun, also educational. And on the left there is what some people call a personification print, Republican. This is where um, various tra tradesmen are depicted as a composite of the tools of their trade. And it's barrels and porter, porter bottles. Uh, he's standing outside a Whitbread pub. Everyone knew about the Samuel Whitbread Brewery. Uh, and um, those, again, used to be very collectible. 
uh, these sort of personifications and indeed the whole different trades were very collectible certain professions medicine dentistry brewers public publicans uh, certain sports were very collectible when i started in the business in fact in 2000 at grosvenor uh, but that, that again seems to be doesn't seem to be happening so much anymore these dedicated collectors are um, not collecting anymore and often trying to sell i suppose so we know that travel and tourism increased in the 18th century as roads improved. Uh, people had more disposable income. There was a general sort of enlightenment thirst for knowledge. We, you'll all be, well, most of you will be familiar with uh, Ogle, Depan, Britannia Depictor or Ogilvy Improved. There's a road, strip road map of a, some Lincolnshire roads on the left. Um, and a very cheap etching from my scrapbook um, of Norwich. It says Norwich. Uh, it doesn't con convey much topographical, precise topographical information. As you can see, it's pretty crude. It's pure etching, uh, late 18th century. It's not very large, and again, was probably printed on a big sheet with other prospects. I maybe it owes its genesis to someone like the Buck Brothers and their prospects in the earlier 18th century. Hard to say, connect it with a particular print, but no doubt it's recycled imagery. Um, and this is the phenomenon I've ref uh, I would call, you know, copies of copies of copies, really. Um, and drawing was not routinely part of the trading of uh, British engravers, unlike their continental counter many of their continental counterparts. So you don't, a lot of them didn't have much sense of draftsmanship. They were just copying copies of copies of copies. Um, and I suppose this is, reflects the sort of, Perhaps the boom in this sort of topographical representation reflects the interest in antiquarianism of the 18th century, where these antiquaries would produce local histories, and they were interested in both the material and textual remains of the past of their particular locality. And I think that fed into a wider sort of patriotism sense of nation. Now, here's an example of the copy of copy of copies phenomenon. That um, here's a British Museum impression of. The first in a set of six views of Dublin, published by Joseph James McArdle in 1753. And that on the right is an etching from the, for the ladies' magazine of, uh, about 20 years later, probably, or so. You can see it's the broad composition is very similar for some changes. Uh, you've, you've got an arable farm here instead of... Uh, uh, a livestock farm by looks by the looks of it in uh, in the Tudor original. Um, I mean, I should say the 1753 was the first imprint, original imprint, and um, it could be that uh, the copyright law had come in in Britain. Of course, it's called as Hogarth's Act because he campaigned for it actually uh, in I think 1735 around there. The copyright law had come in. Uh, protected works for 14 years or artists intellectual copyright for 14 years but uh before that there was no real copyright in britain at all certainly nothing enforced anyway uh, and that probably it could be said depressed the quality of british production for many years because there was no incentive less incentive arguably for producing outstanding original work if you just knew it was going to be copied straight away Now, here's the same view of Dublin, ostensibly. This is by Slack, the Manchester engraver we have already encountered, who uh, was responsible for the Peterloo Massacre image. Uh, early 19th century. It's not very nice recent colouring, I must say. Again, a few changes and tweaks. Um, and he's added most significantly to the figures in the foreground, who are rather genteel, you might have noticed in the previous previous imagery. The, this guy looks like a labourer in the foreground and um, with two sort of perhaps servant girls or anyway lower middle lower, lower class women probably. Um, I speculated in my description that this was perhaps uh, designed to appeal to some of the Irish immigrant community in Manchester of the day. Just a thought. So uh, here's another piece of apparently straight topography, Lancaster Marketplace, a bit later, 1840s, tinted lithograph. 
but you'll find that most of these views of town centres were, well, as you would expect, pu published by the local stationer, bookseller, printer. Often the three functions were combined by the same shop. And you can see in the right foreground, Clark Stationer has got some prints in his window. He'd have sponsored the publication of this, overseen the publication of it, sponsored it, of this view. He might have collaborated with other shopkeepers. They might have take a sh taken a share in profits again with any sales. So it's again a piece of advertising. I mean, just to re-emphasize the point that um, these are all commercial commodities in the main. And you'll all be familiar with these sort of 18th century encyclopedia plates or dictionaries or universal geographies, as they were often called. Granger here owes an unacknowledged debt to Piranesi, of course, going right back to his 18th, 18th century sort of monumental large views of the antiquities of Rome. Um, so which would have gone through many, many copies, circulated in Britain. Um, so that his Veduti di Roma series is very popular. Uh, again, very few of these viewers would go to Rome. Ranger presumably hadn't been to Rome. Again, you're sort of getting what you expect to see when you think about Rome. Uh, it's evoking an emotion of being in Rome. It's not trying to show you what Rome looks like. So into the 19th century, we've got um, a lithograph by Scharf here, George Scharf, who was born in Bavaria, served with the British Army at Waterloo, and um, became set about recording a lot of London's old buildings at a time before they were being actually knocked down. There was a lot of slum clearance in the early 19th century. This shows the Maidenhead Inn, which stood on Diet Street, WC1, in the notorious, notorious Giles slum, which of course was depicted by Hogarth in Gin Lane. Um, so it's a development of the antiquarian ethos almost, but you're wanting to record the present for the, for the, pre for the preservation of future generations. Um, so it's consciously, so this is a consciously, consciously a, doc a visual document. And on the right here, you've got an image of the destruction of the old, of demolition of the old London Bridge after Thomas Lindsay. Again, it's uh, apparently fairly, fairly straightforward visual reportage, uh, reportage. It's, um, I should say, uh, uh, this is number four in a series of four that were separately priced. And presumably you were encouraged as, in fact, as the bridge itself was being demolished to go and buy uh, one of these four Im images as the works progressed uh, as a record of a vanishing London landmark. It's a sort of pictorial journalism that sort of anticipates the sketch style of the illustrated periodicals like the Illustrated London News, the graphic which came along from the 1840s and sort of which and they in turn sort of spelled the end of the news function of the sort of um, handbills and broadsides we talked about right at the start of the tour. The other thing to note is the use of lithography perhaps in both of these um, images. Of course lithographs are printed from limestone blocks and limestone blocks made up a lot of buildings. Um, now whether maybe the, you might say the sort of grainy quality of the lithographic stone somehow evokes, is better, produces a better evocation of the built environment. It's just a thought. So in Bennett's catalogues also talks about ornament prints uh, which may be framed and glazed or fitted up in a cheaper manner to ornament rooms, staircases, etc., with curious borders representing frames, a fashion much in use. And he goes on to list some sort of sets of views of country houses and country house landscape gardens, which, by the way, when they were published, were actually sort of part prospectus advertisement in themselves for the, for the landscape practice of the, of the gardener or architect. Well, here's an example of a printed border or frame, separately printed 
around an etched landscape. Now you might be able to see there are two plate marks. There's a plate mark just outside the image itself. It may not come across on my scan. There's a plate mark or indented line where the edge of the plate would be. There's also a plate mark on the outside of the frame itself, right by the edge of the paper. Um, so ornament, uh, these ornament prints, as they were called, were, were produced in pattern books, which were ostensibly designed for use in the applied arts, but could also be cut up and used to decorate furniture. Um, but also, uh, many printers produced frames like this, borders, four prints, specifically for this purpose. You can see it's printed in different color. I think you can see remnants of the sort of ready brown ink actually on the plate, on the image itself. It's a different color than the margins. So it's the ultimate practical application, I suppose, of prints, for prints as furniture. You paste them to screens, books, not book, well, sometimes book covers even, yeah. Um, tea caddies, niches, um, all kinds of places. I mean, whole rooms, were print rooms as they're called, which are, they were plastered or um, but using varnish pasted straight to the walls. Now this is an interesting thing I acquired, I think from a the ephemera fair, yes, ephemera society fair, and actually sold to the V&A. So trade cards on the right we're talking about, it's trade card size design with a rather macabre rogues gallery of body parts, heads and hands, uh, set into, inset in the frame, the garlanded frame. Uh, these were wax works, I did a bit of research and these were apparently wax work casts of some notorious criminals, which was uh, part of an exhibition in Paris. And there's a Chinese grotto in the middle, I don't know why, maybe it was in fashion, probably it was in, perhaps it was illuminated, it was part of the show. The chinoiserie was all the fashion at the time. So that was an extraordinary little object, very pleased to have found that, and found a museum home. So straightforwardly commercial, bill heads, trade cards, of course, that was the other reason for printing imagery. You can see top left and right, in fact, got a hanging sheet for this Lincolnshire-based tailor. Got a little allegorical scene on the top left, uh, which um, suggesting importation of fine cloth. And we're coming to the end um, now. I should say this kind of jobbing work, this is the kind of work that people, even luminaries such as Hogarth and Blake actually started doing this kind of commercial jobbing engraving, as it's called. And I should say, um, I, I, this talk owes a debt to uh, this book, which uh, if you do, some most some of you will have read, but if you haven't, if you read one book on prints, read this one, William Ivan's Prints and Visual Communication, prosaic title, but an important book, that sort of advocates for what he calls the exactly repeatable pictorial statement, what many works have advocated for the spread of the printed word in terms of its impact on the history and progress of civilization itself and on art history and criticism as well. And uh, I want to end by thanking you all for listening. I'll take any questions if there are any. Well, thank you very much, Jasper. That was extremely interesting. Um, I learned a lot about the, um, the way the print trade worked and I was reminded about how fruitful it is to have years of stock and the extraordinary exploration it it gives dealers like yourself the extraordinary opportunity for uh, exploration it gives dealers like yourself I just want to say to everybody if you'd like to ask questions please tap them into the Q&A um, there's a Q&A at the bottom, um, please just t type in and we'll see it and um, pick it up. Um, so we have one there already and before we go to that I just wanted to ask a question which is that um, you've been talking Jasper about the tie-in between um, both the tie-in between fine art and prints when you know um, subscribers prints are produced to go with a painting etc and also paint um, prints are made after um, after fine art it did, does it ever work the other way around does f do, do prints ever um, influence fine art as as you know depictions of news events or or um, folklore or something? 
certainly certainly there is yeah there's it's an interrelationship that works both ways um perhaps in more subtle less obvious ways um as you say in terms of going from the printed image sort of the influence of the printed image on original art um but there is definitely a relationship there i'm trying to think if i've um think of any specific examples um which i might have come across uh um not immediately springing to mind. I mean, I should say that, of course, well, as I as I suppose I touched on, a lot of a lot of brushes were put to canvas specifically to be made into prints. Of course, we think of I mean Boydell's Shakespeare Gallery. A lot of people will be familiar with those big images, sort of illustrations of Shakespeare's life and plays and works. I mean, he commissioned history quite big history painters in his gallery just to paint to paint, but specifically to paint in ways in partnership with the engra uh, nominated engraver, painting ways which would facilitate easy translation uh, into tracing and translation into by uh, via intermediary intermediary draftsmanship to print. So um, it actually influenced the whole style of history painting in the late 18th century, the engraving trade. It was very much because that was obviously the commercial driving force as the main as the way that the vast majority of people consumed the imagery was through the print. Um, it's a good question. It's an area I'd like to explore more, but I'm sorry I haven't got a more satisfactory answer for you than that at the moment. But it's a very good point, and I'll, that's something I want to look into in a bit more depth, and perhaps will in future talks, actually. Not necessarily the ABA, thank but in my private capacity. Well, th thank you. And as I said, we've already got one question in the Q&A at the bottom. Um, and that question is really, you've been talking about um, the areas of collecting uh, prints that are declining. Um, where, where, where do you see the the the, the future of the, the 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 future trends in the in the print trade and in print collecting? Yeah, this, certainly the market is is driven by modern contemporary prints uh, and um, yeah, I think. As I said, as I mentioned, a lot of traditional prints of the kind I've shown uh, are sort of being regarded as, as a sort of curiosity by some people, or as a compliment, perhaps, to the decorative scheme in their homes or to other artworks in different mediums that they have or uh, would like to collect. Um, I. As I say, I think the specific niche collecting, when you when people wanted to collect, say, every depiction of a, I mean, some people wanted to collect collect every possible depiction of a ballad seller or a, uh, a a licensed premises, and um, that's 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 that seems to have gone. Um, I think uh, I think cartography and maps of the period are still. Got a part to play because I think their graphic simplicity fits well with modern interiors, contemporary interiors. Um, yeah, I think. Um, I mean, I think it it it, it a lot of uh, terminology around you know things like the original print, which is something I sort of deliberately steer clear of in my talk. That's driven by that's a that's a sort of invented term in some ways, or it's, it doesn't help help very much. Uh, sometimes it's a sort of commercial category that the contemporary art market likes to. It's a term the contemporary art market, like, market likes to use, and um, yeah, and it's a sort of curatorial, but I suppose partly curatorial in the museum sector. But um, I'm constantly trying to evangelise these type of prints, uh, but sadly, I'm finding prices. The market is pretty soft for them at the moment, so it's a good question. I wish I knew which. If I had to advise people to collect these kind of, from this, this the broads of the 18th and 19th century, which is obviously my specialism, I suppose, again, I, get, I think about satirical uh, images. The, the bolder ones, bolder the better. Um, good iconography, with because it still resonates today, of course. You know, political scandals resonate. Uh, cartoonists still influenced, obviously influenced by, by Gilray to this day, and people like Gilray and Rollins, and so, that's where I've been looking, but um, yeah, it's no. Uh, 
I wish uh, I'd like to. I'd love to w- watch the market from afar, as I said, as I say, or from a slight distance from now. On. Interesting. Are, are there any other questions amongst um, uh, people watching? If, if there are, please um, hit the chat or the Q and A right now, and we'll see them. Otherwise, I think. Unless there's anything else you'd like to add, Jasper? Uh, no, I don't think so. I um, I hope it's given people a decent introduction to the to if they weren't familiar already, and uh, to some of the bigger bigger what I call the bigger picture, I suppose, of collecting this area. Certainly has. It's been extremely interesting. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jasper. Thank you, Leo. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye.